Well, good morning, church. I didn't bring my phone up with me this time, but we have people from all over checking in. We've had them from Mexico to Washington State to Arizona, up into New Jersey and down into Florida. And so you can just see the coverage is there. And so grateful for all of you. Want to remind you, we know that for a lot of you, you'll have people in uh, over the next couple of weeks and that you might, uh, you might want to go join a brick and mortar church for, for more of a, um, I guess, more of the ceremony that we always enjoy around Palm Sunday and Easter. But whether you join us live or later, as we have said since day one, I want you to please make sure that you're a part of our Palm Sunday and Easter services. They will be very different from what we have done before. There will be a lesson on Palm Sunday that's more about Passover and us. And then on Easter, it'll be a narrative. It'll be a narrative combining all of the Gospels, uh, what little history we can also find outside of the Gospels about that particular week, and then some, uh, some from the rest of the Old Testament and New Testament to fill out the gaps of what happened the day of resurrection, and when did it happen, and where did it happen. And we're going to tell a story, a long story. Uh, it'll be the bulk of the service but I hope that it will bring it more alive to you. And I'm looking forward to it. And today we end our series of the community of God. This is part 11, and we're done with it. I really enjoyed doing the research and reminding myself about what it is to be salt and light in a broken world that is not prepared for you, that did not have 1,500 years of songs and priests and prophets and kings. These people that we live among don't sing our songs. They don't tell our stories. When we refer to scriptures, they don't get the reference. And this is very much the situation that the early church faced. They weren't able to quote what Abraham said, or what Amos wrote, or what Ezra said, without people looking around going, well, who are those guys? I can remember when we were in Michigan, we started, we had three services every Sunday morning. And one of them, we called mosaic. It was uh, because it was a bit of everything. And you would have, it was for people who didn't like church or for people who church had hurt. And so it started rather small, but it grew to be quite a wonderful group of folk. And I'd, I'd tell you a number, but I don't remember the numbers, but I, I know we'd, we'd hover around 200 most Sundays with that particular service. And you'd see little blue-haired ladies sitting right beside goths, so, you know, sitting beside t tattooed guys from the hood. And over here would be a, a family that didn't know third service was different, and they were getting nervous. You know, it was, it was a lot of fun to watch this. But I can remember they didn't know the rules either about church because we hadn't told them that, and they weren't raised with it. And then that one day I said, as, as God said to Abraham, and one of the people yelled, who? And I, that's when I realized... We need to back this off. We need to pull this down. And so we put Bibles in the pews that had page numbers. And instead of saying, we're going to go to Genesis 21, we would say, go to page number. And people would look for it that way. And that was before everybody had it on their phone. Uh, now, we, I have no idea what we to search for this on your phone. And they'd do it. But God is doing something new now. But it's not all that new. It's very much what the first century people found themselves doing. This is our situation. What God is doing is new through our safe harbor and through other works. But the situation we are in is not new. And to prove it, let's talk about Paul. Paul used to be known as Saul of Tarsus. Uh, he was known as Paul for, for most of us and for most of his life. That is not unusual back then for people to have a Greek name, a Hebrew name, a local name. It was a very common thing. Well, you know, like Simon, it, most of us call him Peter. It, is, it, it was normal. So we're just going to call him Paul. When we think of apostles who have left a, a, a great and lasting legacy, we think first of Paul. And why not? He wrote more books of the New Testament than any other. Once a persecutor of Christians, he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus in a very famous story and became the greatest of all the apostles when it came to writing and codifying the faith. Although it must be said here, and we will look at this in greater detail uh, later this spring and into the summer, 
Paul did not intend to make rules for every church and every place and every time. And in fact, though that evidence for that statement is all through his writing. But people miss it. They kind of skip right over it. We're going to look at things like that later. But for right now, we have stayed in Acts for several weeks. And we're going to be in Acts today, but we're skipping chapters. We're skipping all the way to the end, to chapters 21 through 28. What's going on? Paul is leaving Ephesus. He's headed toward Jerusalem. This is making people sad. Not only because they loved him, the time that he spent there, but also because they know Jerusalem is dangerous ground for Paul. There have been things that have changed. The Jewish people uh, had a story, a common story, common hymns, common scripture. When Jesus came, he said it would set father against son and it would split homes. And it really did because some of them accepted him as Messiah and some did not. This caused friction. And those who accepted him were even concerned about all these wild and crazy Gentiles coming in who thought they could just eat anything, not be circumcised, wear whatever they wanted, and talk during church. And it was a struggle. So Paul coming in on the side of the Gentiles, as a Jew, created more friction. And most of what we know about Paul's life is dealing with with the fallout between these groups. When one group that says you are ours behave and say what we say, and the other group is wanting to come in and know Jesus, Paul was there and caught, and it was a very difficult time. When we talk about Jews in the lesson today, it is really, really important you get this. If there was a way I could underline things in your head, I would do that for this. We need to keep in mind that we are talking about the portion of the Jews that did not accept Jesus as their Messiah and who honestly and fervently believed that Paul and the Christians were the problem, that they were aberrant in their theology, dangerous to their community, that God wanted them quiet, so that quieted, so that his people could continue as they had continued. Many Jews were convinced that Paul would destroy them from within and without. He would cause trouble in their theology, but he would also cause, because of the troubles in the theology, they would rise to the level of being noticed by the Romans. And you did not want to be noticed by the Romans. That never ended well. About a week after Paul arrived in Jerusalem, this portion of Jews started a riot when Paul started preaching in the temple, just like Jesus had preached in the temple and caused some, some real upset the last week of his life before the crucifixion. When the Roman soldiers arrived to enforce the peace, Paul surprised them. He said, don't drive the crowd away. Don't pull me away. Let me address the crowd, the very people who'd been trying to kill him, according to Scripture. He told the assembly his story as he told it before. He had been a Pharisee who had spent his life persecuting Christians. He told them how and why he had changed so dramatically and now accepted Jesus as the promised one, the Messiah. The crowd did not react well to his message. In Acts 22 and verse 22, the crowd listened to Paul until he said this, the line where he said, And God has invited the Gentiles in. Then they raised their voices and said, rid the earth of him. He is not fit to live. Well, the Roman officer in charge gave orders that Paul was to be taken away and beaten so that the Jews would be satisfied. Now understand, if you've not followed us before, where have you been? It's been lovely. We've missed you. About 650 some videos are up there. The Romans had no interest in individual rights or in who committed a crime at all. They were interested only in keeping the peace. So they routinely would grab anybody at the center of a disruption and say, calm down, we'll take them and beat them. And they did. And sometimes they killed them and sometimes they imprisoned them. But that settled the crowd. Even though before the Romans arrived, it could have been that the crowds were beating and robbing the guy. It didn't matter to them. It absolutely didn't. You couldn't argue your case. They just wanted peace. 
And see, this is one of the reasons why the Jews who were Christians and the Jews who were not were both very, very worried. And why the combat between them was very worrisome. Paul, after he was beaten, Paul let the beating happen as if he could stop it. Then let the officer know that he, Paul, was a citizen of Rome. And not a citizen who bought their citizenship. Which is one of the main ways Rome had citizens. He was born a citizen of Rome. Which meant his citizenship outranked that of the officer. Which meant the officer was in dire danger of losing his position at best. And his life. For he had beaten a Roman citizen without trial. There weren't that many who could pull it like Paul and say, I have this. Now the officer is frightened. By the way, Paul did not call for his firing and did not call for him to lose his rank or it did not call for him to be beaten equally. He had the right to do so. But in scripture, we learn just because you have the right to do or say something doesn't mean you should. The question on your lips before they open should be, what would advance the cause of Christ? That's what you say and do. The officer got together, with, went back to the leaders of the mob, got them together with Paul again to settle the matter. He doesn't want it to go upstairs. He's trying to keep a lid on it. But the mob erupted almost immediately. And once again, the Romans had to pull Paul out of there and separate the factions among the Jews that were calling for harm, calling for Paul's in punishment or death. A group of 40 of these in that portion of the Jews. And I, we just want to be careful that we're not ever using the term the Jews as a slander against a people. Because we're talking about a small group of them, but they happen to be Jewish. And the Jewish, uh, their Jewishness was driving this, yes, but because they truly believed Paul was bringing in a false messiah. But 40 of them bound themselves by an oath that they would fast until they killed Paul. They planned to ambush Paul as he made his way to a sham peace meeting with the Sanhedrin, which was the Supreme Court-ish, there's no exact parallel, uh, of the Jewish people. Paul got word of the plot that they were going to ambush him and that the meeting was a setup. So he got, uh, his nephew told him, so he in turn alerted the commander of the Roman regiment. He was given a guard, a serious guard. This captain wanted the peace, but he also understood what he had done, and Paul was a Roman citizen, so he kind of overboarded it. 470 horsemen, spearmen, and infantry surrounded Paul. That's a guard. That's a guard. Paul was sent to Felix, a Roman ruler, a, a governor, for examination. Paul made a defense of himself and his conduct in chapter 24 of Acts. Reading 22 through 28 or 21 through 28 would be a really good devotion this week to put this in your mind as a wrap up to how do we do this in an unprepared place. The Jews weren't prepared for it that they thought they were, they should have been, um, we say. Then we also have um, the Romans weren't prepared for it. Nobody outside this group was prepared for it. Here Jesus is landing like an earthquake and a volcano and a thud all at the same time. So in chapter 24, Felix to put him on trial, but Felix couldn't find anything wrong with him. But he left him in prison to keep the peace for two years. Christians, often when we pray, we want God to be a microwave God. I get it. I really, I do too. Lord, make me better. Oh, <laughs> look at that. No allergies, even in Tennessee which would be a miracle. There'd be angels flying about singing. It would be an amazing thing. Cherubs, it, it, great stuff. Or, Father, make my kid behave. And all of a sudden, hello, Mother. Hello, Father. You know, and, and we're going, yes, yes. Would we not all want that? Of course we want a microwave God. We don't have that. We have God. And are you able to accept the God who is, that knows that Paul doesn't need to be rescued from prison because he's been rescued from sin, shame, and himself. Paul's already covered. As he's already told Paul. When he said my grace is sufficient for you. 
Felix was succeeded by another Roman ruler, this one named Festus. Festus wanted to send Paul back to the Jews and let them all sort this out. But Paul played his trump card again as a Roman citizen. And you had the right as a Roman citizen to appeal to Caesar. No, put me on trial in front of Caesar. Now, you might think, well, why didn't everybody do that? Because Caesars were crazy. Uh, If you look at the history of the Caesars, they were worse than the mob trying to kill Paul a lot of times. They killed their own family just because maybe when they grow up, they might decide they want to go against them. But Paul appealed to Caesar. Well, he was sent to Agrippa, who is not Caesar, but up the line. In fact, he was called King Agrippa in Acts 25 and 26. And Agrippa examined him, and he was pretty sure that Paul was mentally ill, deluded. He said, a lot of, you've been studying too much, and it's messed with your brain. He could have freed him. He said, you've broken no law. And he made that very plain. There's no law this man has broken. But Paul had appealed to Caesar, and you can't take that back. So he had to send him to Caesar for trial anyway. If you're wondering, well, why can't they take that back? It was because before they made that rule, soldiers and governors and and minor kings would torture the person until they took it back. You can't take it back. So he says, you've tied my hands. I've got to send you to Caesar, send you to Rome. Paul's trip to Rome is very exciting. We're we're skipping over it. Uh, Just know that it was full of shipwrecks, miracles. And he had such an influence on his captors and fellow prisoners. He made a real impression on them. Once again, salt and light in a place not prepared for salt and light. It was just, it's an amazing set of stories. But we want to focus on something else. Three months later, Paul arrives near Rome The Christians in the area came out and walked with him all the way into the city. You cannot imagine what bravery that is. Because the Romans will kill you for causing any kind of disturbance. They don't care if it's right or wrong. And this man is accused of causing disturbances and of being appealed. It's going to Caesar. And all of these soldiers and all of them are still with him. I don't think the 470. But they're all guard. He's, He's a prisoner. And if you are kind to a prisoner in Rome or today in many countries, you get on a list, a watch list, and they think, you now, what are you up to? Who are you? But they had no fear to come out, or if they did, they subsumed it and just stood there and walked with Paul. I love these people, and I don't even know them. One of these days, I may get to meet them, and that'll be good. The reason I I don't doubt that I'm going to be in heaven or a third in heaven. The reason I say may is because we'll probably be busy. It won't be an entire day of uh, icebreakers. You know, um, there'll be things to do. But anyway, during that walk, they understood he was going to go to house arrest. You didn't go into prison if you'd appealed to Caesar as a rule. It's very rare that that rule was broken. As a rule, you went to house arrest. So he goes to house arrest for another two days years. If you're doing math, it's been over four years since the original complaint, and Paul has been beaten, and Paul has been put in prison for four years. And yet, they'd all said, you didn't do anything wrong. God's timing is not our timing. When we are in this unprepared world, you're going to come across things that you cannot fix in two years, ten years, or five lifetimes. That's when we have to remember Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called by God and told, your job is going to be so tough. You're not going to be allowed to get married, have parties. You're not going to be allowed to go to funerals because funerals are parties then too in a different kind of sense. But you're not, you can't even do that. And here's the news. You're going to preach my word to these people your entire life and they are not going to listen to you. But if there had been no Jeremiah, then the next prophet would not have been listened to and the next one. Sometimes you're the Jeremiah that has to survive. I mean, he never had one good day at work. Not one. God's timing may be that you have a hard life this life. It'll be quite the trade. This life for the next. But that's, while that gives some comfort, it's still pretty hard. It's, pretty, it's still pretty hard to take. Well, 
From a worldly standpoint, things went very wrong for Paul and for Rome itself. Rulers kept coming and going. And finally, by the time it, Paul would get his day in court or might, Nero had come to the throne. Yeah, Nero. Evil, insane, murderous Nero. Nero had no interest in hearing Paul's story. He wanted Paul dead for the crime of being an inconvenient Jew. Paul was isolated now. Seriously isolated. He had no family. He was not a family man. He had no wife. He had no children to care for him. He did not have a group of people that could bring him food, that could bring him his clothing when it got cold. In fact, he writes asking someone to bring him books and his cloak because he's cold. He was rejected by the very churches that he had planted, nurtured, and loved. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, you know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me. Four years in, a beating, and now an emperor that does not want to even hear him, even though he's done the law and appealed to Caesar, and an emperor who's made it very plain, he's going to just have him killed as an inconvenient Jew, a disruption. And every one of the Christians had turned from him. A lot of our safe harbor people have been beaten up by churches. You need to know that God knows exactly what that feels like. Because people, as Mary Alice said, tell stories about God that are not true. And they're there to shame you and scare you. And also because he knows what Paul went through and what so many others have gone through for him. He doesn't forget one bit of it. He doesn't forget one second of it. God is still there, even at this moment. And then chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Even though this had all happened, and this was the result of Paul following Jesus. He tells young Timothy, remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I'm suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, so that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Wow. He regretted nothing. But it was more than that. It was more than that. We're going to get that for just a second. But just realize, Paul did not believe that he was going to be spared the axe, the gibbet, the garot. Somehow, he was going to die. He knew that. In fact, he even said, I am ready to be poured out as an offering. I have fought a good fight. I've finished my race and I've finished my course. He knew he was done. He knew it was over. There was not going to be an earthquake in the middle of the night to open the cell doors this time. There was not going to be an angel to wake up Paul and take off the fetters and escort them into the city. Not this time. But he didn't despair. He believed the story of Jesus would continue to spread even after his his execution. His judicial murder. It reminded me, I got to spend time this week with Bobby Hampton down in death row in Louisiana. And it reminded me of what he said to me whenever they let him know that they were going to do everything they can to restart the death penalty in that state and restart, they have a death penalty on the law, but to actually start carrying them out, which makes him and all those on that row marked individuals. And you could tell a little change in the air when I was there this week. But as Bobby said, you can't threaten me with heaven. And Paul refused to be cowed, refused to back down. Paul had a very few who loved him still. There might have been more. We just don't know them. We only know a few. Foremost among them was Timothy, who he called his son in the faith. Now, I want to ask you a very personal question, and you really need to answer it. It's not a preacher question. It's not something for you to learn by. It's just a serious question. If following Jesus as you have done has led you to four years of deprivation, pain, 
beating, lack of medicine, lack of justice, and you are looking out and seeing the shadow of whatever it is, the axe, the gibbet, or the garrote, what advice would you give your son that you love? After all of you suffered, would you ask him to follow your footsteps? Would you encourage him to hide, to, may, to maybe be more crafty, to be a bit more gentle in the way you present the story of Jesus? Would you, would you just drop the gospel itself as a lost cause? Because it sure didn't do anything for you, it seems, by all the evidence that you can see. It's a bad idea. It's a failed dream. I don't know what I would do. Paul did none of those things. He charged Timothy to do the work because the story of Jesus is, was, and always will be greater than anything else. 2 Timothy chapter 4, among the last words of Paul to his son, who he loved, in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. In other words, when they like it and when they don't. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Does that sound familiar to anybody in the room or in your house churches or you on your couch? Does it? Or those of you driving about. By the way, we just, Derek Glover just let us know uh, that we have now surpassed 100,000 downloads of the podcast. So um, thank you, Derek. He set this up. He volunteers. He's been a very good friend to us throughout all this time. We don't know how far this is going. But even if they don't like it, even if they cancel you, even if I've been disinvited from speaking, I have had speaking appointments canceled when I was on the way to them. I have had uh, emails and such, but I have never gone through what Paul went through. I've never suffered like that. But he says, time will come when they will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say whatever their itching ears want to hear. They'll turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, but not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Wow. And as you heard read to you by our sister Carol, in Revelation 21, verses 1 through 7, the end of the story is what matters. They were faithful unto death. They kept the course. Nowhere in Revelation or in that wonderful, marvelous Matthew 25 judgment scene uh, are people judged on their results. Not a one. We're used to being judged by results, are we not? We're graded in school, and then we're great, you know, did you win or lose at the game? And I know a lot of schools don't keep score, but every kid does. They know. You're not fooling them. And then we're judged in our relationships, we're judged in marriage and dating, and is this acceptable, is that acceptable, and what are your results, and at work, great, you did great, if you're a salesperson, I don't know how you do that, I just don't, it is a difficult job to live by commission, and let's say you have a month where you have doubled what you've ever done before, they don't look at you and say, that's really cool, you can coast a bit, they say, all right, what you going to do next, and God doesn't judge that way, never are we saved by results? Never are we saved by perfection. We're saved by hoping. We're saved by faith. I remember one time speaking at a big event. 
I knew the worship team because I'd worked with them in various forms over the years and all over the U.S. and a bit of Canada. And during the singing, I couldn't sing because I knew their stories. And I kept looking at them, thinking of their stories. One had lost a son a mere three months before. Another one's husband had left her with three children within the last year. A third had come home from university to find his parents divorcing and challenging, you know, forcing him, trying to force him to pick a side. And yet, they sang songs of hope, love, faith, and peace. And their faith rocked me, stunned me into silence, a silent worship, watching their faith, knowing they weren't just singing the songs, that they meant the songs. It, it hit me hard. How can they sing at a time like this? Well, underline this in your brain. Because the Spirit of God in them was greater than anything in the world. And they still hoped in Christ. Although the things that they had hoped in were now gone. Children, marriage, family, mom and dad. God was not. They were overcoming right before our eyes. And I wondered... Does anybody else in the room know these stories? Do they know what they're seeing? They are seeing people overcome the world. Some of you have been blessed by a relatively easy journey so far, and I really hope that you, you continue. I really, I'm not jealous of you a bit. If you slide into heaven going, well, that wasn't hard, that's great. I'm not, not upset, but others like me have had a harder road. But my road's not been as hard as a lot of yours. I know that. I've not suffered near as much as some of you, perhaps even most of you. My childhood friend and I were excited about our first day going to kindergarten together. And the next day we went, or rather I went, he wasn't there. I found out later he died in an accident while riding on his daddy's tractor the day before. I didn't quite understand all of that. But in my life, I've gone to funerals of friends and family so often that by the time I was uh, a junior in high school and two of my classmates died in a car wreck, I didn't even bat an eye. I'd gotten hard too soon. My childhood was rough, but that's because my father had a parenting style and a, a religious style that was just, it was rough. I won't go into details about that, but let's just say some scars remain. And yet, I've not suffered like Paul. I've not suffered like most of you. I've not performed as well as I would have liked. But I keep asking, seeking, and knocking. And Jesus, if you ask, seek, and knock, will honor you for that. Not your arrival, not your understanding, not your, I'm here now and I got it all and it's a nice, nice little package. And we went to church and we checked all the wee boxes and we're good now. No, no. He honors the asking, the seeking, and the knocking. Paul still was doing that in prison. So what do we scarred, broken people do in an unprepared world? What Eric told you to do, find some good to do. And what if they, what if they turn on you because you've done good? Well, welcome to the community of God. That's what Paul did, and that's what happened to him. He charged Timothy, and we don't know what happened to Timothy. But trust the Lord of the harvest to do what he promised to do. Because remember this, the story of the community of God, his story is the story. The one that changed everything. And the one that still is.